Psalm chapter 27. And I want to talk to you about faith in the goodness of God, faith in the goodness of God. And it really comes down to faith. By grace are we saved through faith. We have access into this grace in which we stand through faith. Faith is the access code to all of God's goodness and all of God's grace and all that God wants to do. Because there's one thing that God wants more than anything in this world. And I think it's true of any man. I think it's true of any woman too, but for most, for mo most women, you know this is true about them. But what God wants more than anything in this world from us is to be believed. He's not worried about your obedience. He's not focused on your obedience. He wants you to believe. Because if you believe his promises, obedience will flow from believing the promise of God. Let me give you an example. If I say to you, so if I, if I, if I take a promise from God's word, and I'm just going to take I'm just going to take one, for example, because everybody's heard this verse before, and it's about provision. It's about God's provision for our lives. So I'm just using it because it's an easy example to understand the point that I'm trying to make here. So, uh, Philippians 4.19 says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How many have ever heard that promise in the Bible? Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need. It's a great promise, right? So here. God wants you simply to believe that promise, because if you believe that promise, let me ask you something. If you believe that God will supply all your needs, will you be more tempted or less tempted to steal? Talk to me now. Think now. Think through it. I'll give you a minute. I'll give you a minute. Think through it. You're going to be, if you believe the promise, my God shall supply all my needs. If you believe that promise, are you going to be more or less tempted to steal? Less tempted to steal. Why? Because you believe the promise, right? If you really believe that promise. Now, if you don't believe that promise, are you going to be more or less tempted to steal? When the opportunity to steal and get away with it is available to you, will you be more or less tempted to steal if the opportunity is available to you and you don't believe God's going to meet your needs, you'll be more or less tempted to steal. Which one? More. More, you're more tempted because you don't believe God's promise. You're less tempted because you believe God's promise. So God's focus in our life is not to tell us, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal. I really want you to obey me. I really want you to obey me. I really want you to obey me. If you really love me, you obey me. Obey me, obey me, obey me, obey me. No. God's focus is believe my promise and obedience will be an overflow of believing the promise. It's really simple. How many know the verse? The truth will make you free. Anybody ever heard that one? The truth will make you free. Nobody's heard that verse. All right, so John chapter 8. The truth, say that, the truth will make you free. Is that a promise? It's a promise. God says the truth will make you free. It's a promise. It's absolutely true. The truth will make you free. So, but if I don't believe that promise and I get in a jam and I get in a tough situation, I may be tempted to lie in order to get out of the situation. But if the truth makes me free, then why would I lie? In other words, I'm not tempted to lie. Because why do people lie? The reason we lie, is this okay to talk about stuff that we do? We lie, we steal, we... I don't mean we, we, we do those things all the time, but I mean the reason why, if you have ever lied, and I think, raise your hand if you've, if, if you've never, ever in your life lied, because the only person that should be raising their hand is Jesus, and we're going to look at you, we're going to worship you as soon as you lift your hand, Jesus, wherever you are. <laughs> if 
Why do people lie? People lie because they think, if I lie, I can get out of this situation. What does that mean? That means they actually believe that by lying, they can be made free from the problem or free from the situation. But the truth makes us free. So the reason I lie is because I really don't believe the promise that the truth makes me free. Make sense? So you see, God's desire for us and God's greatest goal for our lives is to believe his promises that by these, um, I know I told you to turn to Psalm 27, but before I do that, look at 2 Peter chapter 2, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Look at what he says. By these, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them, watch what he says, by these promises, so now there's 7,000 promises in the Bible that we know of, there's 7,000 promises. He says God has given us these magnificent and precious promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature of God, having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. Notice what he says. We don't, es we don't escape corruption through our good works. We don't escape corruption because we say, I'm just going to escape corruption. I'm just going to escape corruption. I promise you, God, I'm going to escape corruption. We don't escape corruption and lust through the promises that we make to God. We escape the corruption and the lust through the promises that God makes to us. So if I really believe the promise of God, it's going to persuade the way I act. It's going to persuade the way I talk. It's going to persuade. You see, we've had it backwards. We've been spiritually dyslexic. We see everything backwards. You know, when somebody has dyslexia, they see the word God. They, they, they re the word God is viewed by them as the word dog. They may read it backwards. They may see it backwards. Well, I think oftentimes we see things backwards as Christians because we have spiritual dyslexia. That means we, we, look at it, we look at it the wrong way. We think, if I make promises to God, God will be good to me. But the Christian life is not about the promises we make to God. The Christian life is about the promises that God makes to us. We say, if, if, if I repent of all my sin, and if I repent and I stop this and I stop that and I change this and I change that, then God will be good to me. That's backwards. That's dyslexic. You say, how is that backwards? Don't, it, doesn't, doesn't the Bible say if we repent, God will be good to us? No, it says God is good to the evil and the good. And he causes the sun and the rain to come upon the evil and the good. In other words, God is good even to evil men, the Bible says. Why? Because Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's not our repentance that leads to the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. This is why we have to read the Bible correctly. This is why we have to understand it correctly. And we have to understand which comes first. Does God like I like to use this verse, Revelation chapter one, verse five. Does God cleanse us first and then love us? Or does God wash us first? Does God love us first and then wash us? And it says in Revelation chapter one, verse five and six, it says, knowing this, that he loved us and he washed us from our sins. Put the New King James Bible version up there if you have that. Stick with that and, and, unless you hear me share another one. He, it says he loved us and he washed us and he made us kings and priests. And it's really important that we understand the order of those things. He loved us first, and then he washed us. He doesn't, he doesn't love what is washed. He washes what he loves. He loved us first. And because he loved us, he sent his son to die for us. You get this backwards. Look, look you say, why is that? Come on, you're just being picky, pastor. I am picky, I will admit that. But not about this. I'm not picky about this because I'm picky. I'm picky about this because it shapes how your life is going to go. It shapes every choice you'll ever make in life. Because if, you, if this was written differently, if this was written backwards, he, he washed us 
and then he loved us, then your whole, your, all your decision-making faculties would be surrounded by, okay, I got to get washed, I got to be clean so that God can love me. So now you have a performance-based relationship with God if you think you have to do something in order for God to love you. Now every decision you make is based on, okay, I got to do this so God will love me, or I got to stop doing that so God won't stop loving me. And we have, that's backwards, that's, that's perverted, it's twisted. It's a perversion of the truth. A pervert isn't just somebody who's, who's got some weird sexual ideas and habits. A, a pervert, or to be perverted, is to, to have a twisted understanding of the truth. It's to get it twisted, it's to get it backwards. That's what's perverted. When I realize he loves me, period. That's why he washed me. Now I'm free from a performance-oriented relationship with God. It's not based on me performing in order to get God to do something in my life. God does what he does in my life because he loves me and because I believe. And really, Jesus boiled it down to that when he's, he said, here, here are the commandments. You want to know what the commandments are? It's no longer do not steal, do not do this, do not. That's not the focus. The focus is on in 1 John chapter, in 1 John chapter 4, God says, here's the commandments. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. Because if you love one another, you will not lie to one another. If you love one another, you will not steal from one another. If you love one another, you will not hurt, despise, gossip, and speak negatively about one another. Amen. So instead of focusing on the rules, don't gossip, don't do this, it's backwards. If you have love, you won't do those things. If you love that person, you won't do those things. If I love him, I will obey him not to, not to prove my love, but I will obey him as a what? I taught you guys this. I'll obey him as a what? I'll obey him as a reflex of my obedience. Obedience is a reflex. If this understanding of God's goodness lands on you the right way, if it hits you right, the reflex will be natural. You'll naturally obey God if it hits you right. If it doesn't hit you right, you won't obey him. But if it hits you, see, you can't try to manufacture a reflex. You, the doctor or whoever's testing your reflex has to hit you in the exact right spot. And if they hit you in the exact right spot, your leg kicks out. You don't prepare for it. You don't study. You don't go to college on how to have a reflex. Right? You have to watch videos. You don't have to go on YouTube and say, how do I have a reflex? I wonder how, I gotta, somehow I got to figure this out, man. I, I need a reflex. I need to figure out this reflex thing. No, if it lands on you, if it hits you the right, in the right spot, the reflex is automatic, man. If this love that we're talking about, if this grace we're talking about, if, this, if these promises and the goodness of God that we're talking about, if it lands on you, if it hits you in the right spot, obedience is the reflex of it hitting you in the right spot. Does this make sense to anybody? Talk to me, man. Let's have some, let's have some yelling back and forth, you know. Tell me, oh, man, go ahead and yell out, no, that ain't true. Or say, yes, it is, if you, if you, if you believe it, right? Like we used to say, amen or oh, my. If it, <laughs> right? There's... There's, there is the proof right there that out of the mouth of babes shall come forth praise. But shut that child up in the meantime. No, I'm just kidding. I'm totally, totally kidding. Don't get offended. All right. Um, Psalm 27. Look at this. Verse 13. Watch what believing does. Watch how believing affects. Put up now for this verse, put up the New American Standard translation. Thanks, you guys. Now put up that. Now watch this. I would have despaired. I would have despaired. Now despair is an emotion. Despair is a feeling. Has anybody ever felt despair? You know what I'm talking about? Wow, finally I got an amen. I got an oh yes here. Wow. Okay, now I, need, now I know where we're all at. We're despairing, man. <laughs> despair, it's an emotion. It means, it means to lose heart. 
It means to, it means to be discouraged. It means to feel like giving up. And the reason people commit suicide is not because they necessarily... Now, there are some people who have had a brain... They have a brain imbalance. They have a chemical imbalance. But for the vast majority of people, and I was one of them that was tempted to do that, and I had one of my best friends that actually did kill himself, and I've been surrounded in my life with people that have committed suicide. I wasn't the cause of them committing suicide, I hope, but it's funny that I was surrounded by all those people, and I'm the common denominator, so maybe there is a problem. (laughs) But seriously, every one of them had come to a place of deep despair. And the only, the only escape in their minds was to take their own life. How sad that that's the only alternative that they had come to. I wonder if they had come to a church that taught the goodness of God. Because religion makes me want to kill myself. Religion does. Not Bible Christianity. Bible Christianity is the most liberating, the most love-filled, grace-filled, power-filled life that one could ever hope, dream, or imagine. But this, this, this idea that, that we're just trying to keep all these rules and keep all these commandments in order for God to be happy with us, oh, the misery, the despair. And how about the disappointment we feel? How about the people that have promised us things and they, they failed to deliver? How about the promises we've made and we failed ourselves? Despair is a real emotion and it's a real feeling. But notice where despair comes from. Despair grows in the soil of doubt. It grows in the soil of doubt. And that's why he says, I would have despaired unless I believed. Now here God is going to show us something. All of our feelings are the byproduct of what we believe. All of our feelings. See, we try to stop feeling this and stop feeling that. You can't stop feelings unless you start and stop believing something that's feeding the feeling. The despair is a result of what he believes. I would have despaired. I would have given up. I would have lost heart. I would have been discouraged unless I believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And by the way, the land of the living is this life right here. We're in the land of the living. We're the ones living right now. It's not when we die. Of course we know that. Of course we know we're going to see the goodness of God in heaven. But God says we can see his goodness right here in the land of the living. And if you believe you will see the goodness of God, then you'll stop despairing. He said the emotion of despair is the byproduct of what he believed. And he's not going to despair because of what he believes. And David, the thing I love about David is he's so, he's so honest. He's so raw with God. Read the, this is just one example, but you go through the Psalms and, and David's like, man, Lord, when are you, when are you going to show up? Have you left me? Have you forsaken me? What is, what is the matter with this world? Why, why are these people after me? My mother has forsaken me. My father has forsaken me. But he always, he's honest and he's raw, but then he always finishes his sentences or finishes his psalms with, yet I will trust you. Yet I will trust you. He's like, oh, I would have despaired. Life sucks, man. Sometimes. Am I in the right church, or is that, a, is that a swear word to you, cuss? I hate this life. I said that this week. I hate this life. You say, whoa, you hate life? I hate this life. Because here's what I hate about this life. Whenever you need, when, whenever you have to make up a password for something, whether it's a phone, whether it's a bank account, whether it's some other app, it, it's so, I mean, I hate it because 
no, none of them operate on the same formula. And some of them are like for your phone, it's like four, it's like four numbers, that's easy. But for your bank account, it's like you need a capital letter and some numbers and an exclamation point or some, some punctuation and, and then some other thing you need, you know, you, you need to make sure that you don't have any numbers repeat themselves or any capitals repeat, any letters repeat. I mean, I, mean, I hate this life. Because there's too many access codes you got to figure out. That's why I like the life, that's why I love the life of God. There's only one access code that gets us everything and it's faith, faith. Faith brings us into the grace of God. Faith brings us into the love of God. Faith causes the promises to come to pass. Faith causes our prayers to be answered. It's simply, it's simple. It's not hard. It's easy for somebody like me to understand. This, this, this old dude, long beard, I don't know if he's in here today, but he was in the between services. I was out in the lobby and he came up to me. He's like, hey, pastor. And, he, you know, he's, you know, and he's just, a, just a, the sweetest guy. But he's... Um, but he said to me, man, I'll tell you what, uh, the reason I like this church is because you make it easy for a guy like me to understand it. I'm like, listen, because I said, let me tell you why. And he's like dressed in overalls or something. He's got this long, shaggy beard. And I'm dressed in a nice suit. And I got a really nice beard. And I'm really, really good looking and really, really <laughs> smart. Really, really. perfect hair, and, you know. No, I, I joke about that because I, I, don't see, I don't see myself that way. I see myself like, like he sees himself. I said to him, this is what my answer was. He said, man, I love it because you make it easy for a guy like me to understand. I said, that's because I'm a guy like you. And I need to understand it. I'm a guy like you. We're all guys like each other. I would have despaired. I can't tell you how many times I thought about killing myself before I was saved. And then after I got saved, I thought about it more. You know why? Because when I first got saved, it was like I knew it was Jesus and me. Jesus loved me. He forgave me. He washed me of my sins. And it was great. And I would read my Bible and I, would, and I was messed up. I was really screwed up. And I would read my Bible and everything was okay. And even when I read the Bible and saw all the contradictions of my own life, it didn't bother me because I knew there was hope in the Bible. I knew there was hope in God. So everything was going good when I first got saved, when it was between me and the Lord. And then I met some Christians. <laughs> and I know some of you are looking at me like skeptically, like, okay, this guy's been smoking something. And No, I don't... I really gave up smoking a long time ago. Now I, I really, now I only smoke when I'm really, really, really drunk. But the point is, <laughs> I'm challenging your religion. Because I, I got all of you thinking, is he serious? <laughs> Let's go back to Willow. <laughs> whatever, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Who, look, does it look like I've been drinking? Yes, it looks like it. But where, at what point this morning would I have been drinking? I, I'm happy because God loves me. God's for me, not against me. The reason I said, the reason I said I was so, the reason I said I was so depressed when I, when I met Christians is because all they, all they said to me was all the things I needed to stop doing. Every Christian I met was like, okay, you got to stop doing that. 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 Where are you going, ma'am? Willow? <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> I'm totally kidding. I love you. You're the best. All right. Everybody look up here. They all wanted to put this, this coat of religion on me. Now you got to start acting this way. Now you got to start acting that way. Wait a minute. God 
fulfilled his greatest promise in my life. Would you agree with me that the greatest promise for our lives is the is the promise of salvation? And God fulfilled the greatest promise in the universe, the promise of salvation, while I was a sinner. He loved me and he died for me. Now, I know this is falling on. It's, I got some reflexes coming from some of you. You're like, ooh, this is landing on me really funny, Pastor. But listen, he saved me without me doing anything to earn it. What did I do to get it? What did I do to receive salvation? I believed. I confessed. Jesus is Lord, believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And what happened? I was saved. It was a miracle. And the, that's the greatest gift of God, to be saved. So now, after I get saved, all these Christians say, well, if you want any more of the promises of God to come to pass in your life, you got to do this and you got to stop this. Wait a minute, I didn't have to stop that and stop this and start this and start that to get saved. Why do I have to all of a sudden perform now for God to keep any of his other promises? Shouldn't I do the same thing that got me the first promise fulfilled? What did I do? I believed. I simply believed. I get it. I know some of you are like, whoa, that's whoa, take it easy, man. You're stepping out there on some water. Well, look, I realize this is hard for the religious minded to receive because we love to feel like we did something special to get God to approve of us, like we did something special to earn it. I'm here to tell you, man, I know too much about me to think that I could have done something special enough to get God's blessing. I know too much about me. I know. Listen, are you hearing what I'm saying? I know too much about me to think that it's about me or to think that I could have done it or I could have earned it or I could have deserved it. I realize it's all about him. It's what he did for me. It's what he did for you. And guess what? Guess who that glorifies? Listen, guess who it glorifies when you realize it's all about him? It glorifies him. But when you think you earned it, you did it, you performed it, you promised your way into God's blessing and God's favor. If you have to do something to get God's favor, it ceases to be favor. Now you have to buy it. It's no longer a favor. Now it's just a trade. I'm not in a trading relationship with God. Do you see what God's trying to do in the world today? If he can free us from all the religion that, is, that has imprisoned us and held us hostage to have to perform for God, if we can get free, the world is going to come running to church. Not because of the music, not because of cupcakes. You know, it's amazing. We discovered who the real members of the church were when we stopped giving out donuts for free every Sunday. They said, well, we're giving all these donuts out every Sunday. It costs such and such. I'm like, why are we giving? Like, really? Like a person, we need it. Like, first of all, we're going to make everybody sick with all the junk in those donuts. And secondly, they're only, if they're only coming for the donuts, then what, what, that's, that's, that's going to be the crown we want in heaven. You, you, you brought a lot of people to the church because you were really, you picked the right donuts, man. You picked the best donuts. Just lost another one. He's just proving the point that, you know, okay, you're, he's like, now I remember why I thought about leaving this church. There are no more donuts here. We said, okay, stop giving people donuts. Let's see what happens. Like, how does a church, what a, what a miracle that any church is when you think about it. The church that tells people, come, come and give your money, come and serve, Wow, this is the quietest it's ever been in this church, ever. Just now. Churches tell people, come and give your money. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. Come and give your money. Come and serve. Come and learn how to die to self. And people come. 
What would make you willing to give, willing to serve, and willing to die to self? Because you discovered the goodness of God. Because once you see how good he is, You know why people don't give while we're on that topic? Why people, why people don't give? Because they don't believe the word of God. It's not because you're so stingy and selfish and evil and wicked. Now, most of us are, but the real reason is, no, I'm just kidding. The real reason we don't give is we just don't believe the promise. What promise? Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over if you... If you don't, you really got to be stupid not to give if that promise is true. If that promise is true, if he's going to give back, good measure, press down, shake together, running over, if Jesus said that, then we got to be really stupid people not to do it. If I promised everybody, hey, anybody that gives me a dollar today, I'm going to give you 10 or 30 or 100 back. No, I'm going to give you 30, 60, or 100 back in this life. You give me a dollar, I'm going to give you 30, 60, or 100 back. Now, I'm not trying to create a formula here. I'm not trying to preach some formula about giving and receiving. I'm trying to teach a principle here. If I said to you, give me a dollar today, everybody give me a dollar, and, and, and in this lifetime, I'm going to give you 30, 60, or 100 fold back. Everybody would give me a dollar, right? Why? Because you're so generous? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> because of a promise. And Jesus said, whatever you give to God's kingdom, he'll give back 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. I'm not here to teach a formula. I'm simply giving you a principle, I'm trying to make a point. So why don't we give then? Why are we afraid to sacrifice? Because we don't believe that God will return our, our investment. Why don't we plant seed? We don't believe God will grow the harvest. Why don't we love one another? Why don't we forgive people? Because we don't believe that, that we'll be set, setting ourselves free. If we forgive, we'll be setting ourselves free. We don't believe it. I would have despaired. Psalm 27. I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. It's all about believing. Forget about the emotion. Don't focus on the emotions. Don't focus on what it looks like. Just make up your mind today that you're going to believe that you will see the goodness of God. Look at what Jesus said to Martha or Mary after Lazarus was dead for four days. In, Luke, in John chapter 11, verse 40, Jesus said, she, she says in verse 39, uh, Jesus, um, he's been dead four days. Why would you say come forth? The, his body must stink after four days. He's been dead. Verse 40, Jesus says in John chapter 11, verse 40, did I not say to, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you dance around, no. If you make all these promises, no. If you cross all these T's and dot all these I's, no. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Look at Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Jesus said, whatever things you ask for, believe you have received them. Look at the New, New King James, I think it says it, or the King James says it this way. Believe you have received them them believe you have received them and they shall be granted to you you'll have them he doesn't say by the way as soon as you have them believe you have them he says when you ask believe you have received them and then you'll have them don't believe you'll have them when you have them believe you have them when you ask Believe you have received it. I know that, is, oh, that doesn't make sense. Exactly. But this is God's way of moving in our lives. Whatever things you ask, believe you have received them and they'll be granted to you. 
you'll have them. Not, I'll, as soon as I see it, I'll believe it. That's what Thomas said in John chapter 20. Jesus shows up and Thomas was like, no, you guys didn't see him. You must have seen a ghost or something. And Thomas says, unless I see the nail prints in his, in his hands and in his side and the spear hole in his side, I'm not going to believe. So Jesus walks in after he says that. He walks in and he says, Thomas, come here. Remember? And he says, look here, my hands. And touch here, my side. Now you believe? But then he says, but blessed are those who have not seen. And yet they believe. We need to have faith. We need to have faith in the goodness of God. We need to believe. We need to expect God to do exceeding abundantly, above and beyond all that we can ask or think. We need to set our expectation on the goodness of God. We're going to see his goodness. 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 What's going to happen? Despair is going to leave. Depression is going to leave. Fear is going to leave. Anger is going to leave. Bitterness is going to leave. Because it's all about perspective. It's all about perspective. Look at, let me close with this thought. Genesis 50, verse 20. Look at what he says. After Joseph has been betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, he rises because God was with him. He rises to become the prime minister of all of Egypt and is in control of the entire earth. You understand? Doesn't matter what people do to you. When you believe in the goodness of God, it doesn't matter what people do to you because you know that what God will do for you is far greater than what people have done to you. It's all about perspective. He said, as for you, when he finally reveals himself to his brothers, he feeds them, he gives them all this grain, he saves them, he saves Israel, he saves the lineage of Jesus, which is the tribe of Judah. He, he does all that he does to save the world so that Jesus can be born so God can actually save the world through Jesus. But in the process, his brothers betray him. His brothers hate him. His brothers are jealous of him. His brothers sell him into a slavery. He's a slave in Potiphar's house. Then he's a slave. Then he's uh, imprisoned in Pharaoh's prison. But he believes in the goodness of God. And how do we know? Because look at his perspective. When he could have been like, okay, yeah, finally I get my opportunity to have revenge on you. Now I'm going to put you guys in prison. Let's see how you like it. First I'm going to put you in a pit. First I'm going to strip you, then put you in a pit. Then I'm going to sell you as a slave. No, he doesn't get back. He doesn't retaliate. He says, guys, don't be afraid. I think he might even say that in verse 19, maybe. Let's look at verse 19 real quick. Is that what he says? He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What, what will deliver us from fear? Believing in the goodness of God. He says, don't be afraid. For am I in the place of God? I'm not going to, that's not my part to get back at you, to avenge myself. No, you meant evil. But God turned it, is what he literally is saying. God turned it into good. Remember, he causes all things to work together for good. He doesn't cause all things. God didn't cause the brothers to throw them in. The brothers did that because of their jealousy. But God caused it to turn around for good, to turn into good. God turned it into good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. See, his perspective was... You meant evil against me, but God's goodness, God's goodness is greater than your evil. Good always triumphs over evil. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, overcome evil with good. You see, Joseph understands the goodness of God. He's like, you meant evil against me, but it could not prevail because what the devil sent to defeat you, God bent to complete you. What the devil sent to discourage you, God bent to encourage you. 
What the devil sent to destroy you, God bent to employ you. You meant evil, but God, but God, but God, God's goodness turned it around. God's goodness turned it around. Joseph could say, like David, I would have despaired unless I believed I would see the goodness of God. What is against you right now? If you will believe in the goodness of God, God will turn it for you. Believe in the goodness of God. It's going to turn for you. Believe. You say, what do I have to do? Believe. Believe in what? Believe in the goodness of God. It's all about perspective. We have to have the perspective of God's goodness. We'll always turn it around. In closing, I'll tell this story about perspective. Thomas Wheeler was the CEO of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company. He tells on himself, he said he and his wife were driving along Interstate Highway. When he noticed the car was low on gas, he got this as many years ago. Wheeler gets, out of the, gets off the highway at the next exit, finds a rundown gas station with just one gas pump. He asks the lone attendant to fill the tank and check the oil. Again, this is years ago. Then went, then went for a little walk around the station to stretch his legs. As he was returning to the car, Mr. Wheeler noticed that the gas station attendant was talking to his wife, and they were like quite animated and they ha- smiling and laughing. The conversation stopped when he paid the attendant, but as he was getting back into the car, he saw the attendant wave at his wife, and he heard him say, it was great talking to you again. As they drove out of the station, Wheeler asked his wife if she knew the man. She readily admitted she did. They'd gone to high school together and had dated steadily for about a year and came close to being married. Mr. Wheeler looks at his wife and says, boy, were you lucky that I came along. If you had married him, you'd be the wife of a gas station attendant instead of the wife of a CEO. My darling, the wife responded to her husband, you're the lucky one. You see, if I had married him, he'd be the CEO and you'd be the gas station attendant. It's perspective. God, we got to start seeing it from God's point of view. He's brought you this far. It wasn't your goodness that brought you this far. It was God's goodness. And he's not going to leave you now. Because if you leave me now, you take away the very part of me. No, baby, please don't go. I needed somebody to get up there high. Thank you. Let's stand together.